Good morning. Pastor Hanley asked me to pre- preach and uh, give my last great words. One, I'm not going anywhere. And, uh, and I don't have any great words, but God's word is always great, whoever preaches from up here. So uh, I will be preaching uh, next week and the week following on Joshua 1. But before Joshua 1, it's Deuteronomy 34. You see, in the English ministry, uh, I am under Hanley. So he assigns me. Okay? So he's my boss in the English ministry. But I'm his boss in the church. <laughs> One of the things that I really appreciate, and I think you too appreciate, is God's, uh, God's grace, God's provision, God's gifting, and God's leading of Pastor Hanley and Pastor John in preaching God's word and in shepherding our church. Let us express our appreciation and encouragement to them. Let's do that right now, okay? If you were in my shoe, you would see how much and how hard they labor to love you. And just as my brother often says, he loves you more than you know. And I'm going to use that later in my sermon. Okay? Uh, today we want to just focus on Deuteronomy 34 before we get into Joshua chapter 1 the next two weeks. Today's sermon will be a little less expositional than normal and a little bit more applicational. And if I personally tangent, will you excuse me and be patient with me and I'll get us back on point, okay? All right, uh, if you would uh, follow on the outline, and because of the time, uh, and I don't think I'm going to have enough time, so if, if I'm going to be late, uh, excuse me already, uh, but I'll try, I'll try. And because of that, uh, there are passages, there's many passages to the points. I'm not going to have time for most of them to flip to it. Will you turn to it, and you see that God's Word speaks to you? And those of you with uh, you know, electronic things, you could do it a lot faster. Those of you who are in sword drill, you can beat them. Okay? All right. So uh, let me just start off in the introduction reading Ecclesiastes, one of my favorite books, Ecclesiastes. And uh, you, you just finished Ecclesiastes, right? Okay, so in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is one of my favorite chapters, and it starts off like this, and I won't read the whole thing, but I'll read some of it, and you follow along. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1, there is a appointed time, there is a appointed time for everything. There is a time for every event under the heaven, a time to give birth, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up. A time to weep and cry together. A time to laugh and listen to jokes. A time to mourn and a time to dance. And it goes further and further along. A time to search. A time to give up as lost in verse 6. A time to tear apart. A time to sew together. And then it concludes in verse 11. He, God, has made everything. He, God, has made everything appropriate in its time. And He has also set eternity in our hearts. He has given us an eternal spirit, eternal soul. God has made everything appropriate in His time. And so there is a, there's a point of time by God. God appoints and plans for times of transitions in our lives on earth and beyond the earth on earth and beyond the earth. For example, let me just give you an example of Jesus Christ. There was a point of time for the eternal God-man Jesus. He was eternal before he was born. For the eternal God-man Jesus to be born 22,000 years ago, a time of 30 years for him to wait before his public ministry, a time a time of three years where Jesus revealed himself as a substitutionary Lamb of God, just as we have sung who takes away our sin as we remember in the Lord's Supper. A point of time for him to die, a point of time for him to rise from the grave, and a 40-day period before his appointed ascension. And finally, finally, brothers and sisters, Christians, there is a appointed time when Jesus will come back for you and me his disciple, just 
as he says. There is an appointed time for every event under the heaven. Since God has appointed our transitions and our expected and unexpected changes in our lives, God wants to be very much the constant. God wants to be the constant in our lives of changes. Let me repeat that again. Since God appoints our transition and our expected and unexpected changes in our lives, God wants to be your constant in all your life transitions and changes. Let us now examine and learn from God's ordained transition in his servant Moses and how how what we learn can apply to your transition and my transition. And so there's two points, relatively simple, where you follow along with me. And I'll try to go uh, some of these relatively fast and perhaps you go back and study some of the scriptures. Then the first point is God's transition and continuity for his servant Moses. It would be helpful if you turn to Exodus chapter 2. Uh, turn to Exodus chapter 2, follow this a little bit. Exodus chapter 2, and we see the beginning and the ending of 40 years, three sections of 43s in the life of Moses. And the first one is the beginning of 40 years in Pharaoh's court, starting in Exodus chapter 1. And you can read, you can multitask, right? You read and you listen and you look up, do both, okay? All right, so Moses was born into a very dangerous, a very precarious time. Pharaoh, that is the king of Egypt, had ordered that all newborn Hebrew boys were to be immediately drowned in the Nile River. However, however, remember God? God the constant? However, God was with Moses, even as a newborn boy. God was with Moses so that the Nile did not become his grave, but it became a river of life. It became a real life on which Pharaoh's own daughter found him and raised him as her own son in the king's court for the first 40 years of his being. However, there was a transition to come. At about 48, if the age about 40, and you said, where, 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 where did we get 40? Uh, write it down, Acts 7.23. The New Testament helps us to interpret the Old Testament. At the age of 43, he had a transition coming. What happened was Moses was out about the people, and he witnessed an Egyptian beating a fellow Hebrew. Now, by this time, he knew he was a Hebrew. Okay? He knew he was a Jew. And so Moses got mad, got angry, and impulsively killed that Egyptian, and thereby ending the initial 40 years of privilege in the king's court. Moses' subsequent, subsequent escape into the land of Midian was then to lead to the beginning of his next 40 years of self-exile in the desert as a shepherd. Now, Moses at that point might have thought, wow, my life is over. My life is over. However, Yahweh God, Yahweh God was God was not finished with Moses. In fact, Yahweh God was just beginning with Moses. Just He was just paving the way to Moses' future. So God, God had saved Moses from the Nile for his own plans and purpose. Let me say that again. God had saved Moses for his own plan and purpose. And will you directly Apply that to yourself. God saved you for his own plan and purpose. And he is not finished with you and me yet. And so God was not finished with Moses. And therefore, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, if you're following along, God moves into action. God moves into action in the miraculous burning bush. What happened was Moses was in the desert. She saw this bush burning, and it kept burning, burning, but it didn't burn out. 
And so God moved into action in the miraculous burning bush and called Moses to partner and to work with him in what God was going to do. And God's what? God's plan and purpose for saving Moses. God calls us to partner with him, to work together with him, to carry out his plan and purpose. And God's plan and purpose was to deliver his chosen people, the Israelites, uh, from Egypt. And like most of us, like you and me, immediately he objected, uh, no, I can't do that. A sense of inadequacy fills us when God calls us to do and be what he calls us to do and be. And we said, we can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that emotionally. I can't do that physically. I can't do that. I don't have that power, inner or outer. And so after immediate objections due to the feelings of inadequacy, Moses finally ends his exile in the desert and begins and transition to his next phase of being God's servant. And that meant going back, going back, to Egypt, and going back to the court of Pharaoh, from which he ran away 40 years ago. And this was the beginning of the final 40 years of Moses' life, which focused on God's awesome deliverance of the Hebrews from slavery. However, it also included 40 years of Israel disobedient, wandering in the Sinai Peninsula, even though they were so close to the promised land. They could have entered into the promised land any time during those decades. But because of the disobedience, they won the 40 years. And finally, after this disobedient generation died in the desert, without entering into God's, God's provision of the promised land, Moses led the faithful remnant, which include Joshua and Caleb, which you have studied about before, to the border of the land that God promised to the people. And so they were now at the foothill of Mount Nebo and at the peak of uh, Pisgah, which is now Jordan, which is now Jordan. And so finally we come to then Moses' death and new beginning. And that's what we're going to focus on in Deuteronomy 34. And in this last chapter of Deuteronomy, we find Moses' final earthly transition. God was with Moses in each stage and in each transition of Moses' life, whether he realized it or not. As his children, as Christians, God is with us whether we realize it or not, as uh, depicted in that, by that relatively uh, famous poem, Footprints in, the, Footprints in the Sun, in the Sand. And if you don't know what that is, ask your neighbor later, okay? And so God was with Moses. And this, this is summarized, this is revealed and summarized actually in Joshua 1. And so if you will flip back from Deuteronomy 34 to uh, Joshua We'll get a preview of, of next week. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. And in the middle of verse 5, and we're just going to read one clause of it. It says, just as I have been with Moses. And so in that short clause, not even a complete sentence, the Holy Spirit inspires this, this, this word to reveal and remind us that God was with Moses in each stage of his life and in each transition in his life. Yahweh God was Emmanuel to Moses. Yahweh God was God with us to Moses in his life. So Moses, God was with Moses all the way. Now Moses' journey and service on earth was to come to a appointed end. So Will you uh, read silently as I read a, a few verses of Deuteronomy chapter 1, I'm um, chapter 34, verse 1, and then verse 4 to 7. Now Moses, verse 1, chapter 34, Now Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, 
You know, when I visit the uh, when I when I visit the the Holy Land, that's what I did. I, I took the uh, the Exodus route. We started from Egypt, went to the Sinai Peninsula, then we came up to Jordan, and we were at Mount Mount Nebo, looking into Israel, and said, "Oh wow, this is where this is where Joshua and the Israelites went in, and this is where Moses looked over into that land." And so, if you ever go to the Holy Land, do that trip. It's so much better than just doing Israel. Okay, tangent. Now Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land. So you could see, you could see into Israel. Gilead as far as Dan, verse 4. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants, and I will let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. I will let you see it. Now, God found Moses faithful. And this is not a knock on Moses that he didn't get to go in. But we have to remember that what we do in this life has consequences. And if you don't know the background, you, you, you study it yourself. But what Moses did, Moses was faithful, but one time he got mad and he did something that God didn't ask him to do. And uh, most people feel that this was part of the consequences. This was God's appointment for Moses. But still, God found Moses. In fact, God was more intimate with Moses than with almost any of the characters of the men and women in the Bible. And so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. Notice that? Moses died. What? Why did Moses die? According to the word of the Lord. God appointed him to die at that time. Okay? And he buried him. Interesting, huh? He, 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 who's he? God buried him. I would like to see that. I would have liked to be in that, that funeral service. And he, God, buried him in the valley of the land of the Moab, opposite uh, Beth Peor. Uh, but no man knows his burial place to this day. Although Moses was 120 years old, he died, when he died, his eyes were not dim and his vigor not abated. So when I die, I want my vigor. My eyes are shot already. So, so there's no hope for that one. Okay? So, but he was, it says he was still strong. It wasn't because he was sick or he was incapacitated or he had Alzheimer's that God took him. God took him. At God's, according to God's word, at his appointed time. All right? So, um, I gotta find my place again. I, I distracted myself by making a joke. <laughs> uh, so now Moses' journey and service was, uh, on earth was to come to its appointed end. Okay? And we just read that. However, Moses' death was not the end of Moses. I want, I want you to hear this very much because we have such a, uh, earth-centric, uh, earth-centric, uh, view of life. That when we die physically, we think, oh, man, most of my life is, you know, pretty much gone, you know? The rest is just sitting in the clouds and playing a harp, which is wrong. If you haven't studied your Bible, okay? That's from secular, uh, 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 our secular uh, understanding of heaven, of God. Okay. However, God, however, Moses' death, physical death, was not the end of Moses because what in Ecclesiastes three eleven, God had put eternity. God had put eternity in his heart. God has put eternity in every man and every woman born into this world's heart. And where he is in eternity, who he is with is determined on the choices that we made here. But God had put eternity in his heart. Will you note this? And even write it down. Note, a person's physical death is but a doorway to a new beginning. A person's physical death is but a open door to a new beginning. And we choose what new beginning we want after death. Someone once said that hell 
is God giving people what they wanted in this world. That is, I don't want you, God. And so hell is where God isn't. And that's the torment of hell. When you realize the love of God, the creator of God, the lover of our soul, and you're separated. Just think about the one that you are most in love with, and you're separated. And, and so a person's physical death is but a doorway to a new beginning. And so those of you who are visitors, you, you're not a believer yet, God, will not, God is not going to force you. God is not going to force you into heaven. God will give you what you choose. Physical death will be the doorway to a new beginning. In fact, for the Christian, the ending of life paves the way to the beginning of a new stage of life. Eternal life starts right here. When we die physically, we go to a new stage of eternal life. A fresh, advanced experience of the person and the presence. The person and the presence of God. Now, Jesus and the New Testament clearly shows us this reality for Moses uh, in Christ's transfiguration. If you're fast, you could turn to it, but if not, you listen to me. This is recorded in Matthew 17.3 17, when uh, Jesus took Peter, Peter, not Paul, James and John, Peter, James and John, I'm just going to say Peter, Paul, and Mary. <laughs> and that dates me. Uh, so he, he, he took him up and he was transfigured. And who was there? Who was there? It was Moses and Elijah. Moses was trans, how should I say? He was, he, he, he paved the way by his death into the new beginning with, uh, with, with God. Elijah didn't, he, he didn't even pave the way by, by death. He, his way was paved by the chariot of fire, right? Yeah. So they were both there. So Moses was there. I wish, sometimes I wish the scripture would tell us more about, you know, up there or presence of God. I think that we just can't probably understand it. It doesn't tell us a lot, but it, it shows us very clearly. Moses' death was not his end. It was a new beginning. And we get a glimpse, uh, we get a peephole of that new beginning in Matthew 17, 3, as, as Jesus in his glory is with Moses and Elijah in their glory. And I wish I could get a further picture, but that's all we have for today, okay? Uh, so, and, and Peter, and James and John witnessed this, and we, we, we get to see it. We get to, they shared it with us. There is an appointed time for every event under the heaven. There was a God appointed time for every event, every transition in the life of God's servant Moses. And each ending was a appointed paving of a way to a new beginning. Not only under the heaven, not only those 40 years, but also even in heaven, into and in heaven, where God dwells and where God reigns. In addition to, uh, in addition to the earthly inn of Moses paving the way to a new beginning for him, his earthly end also paved the way for Joshua. Okay? For Joshua and for the collective chosen people of Israel. Will you look at Deuteronomy 34 9 with me? Deuteronomy 34 9. I'm just going to read a couple of words. Now, Joshua. See, verse 8 ended up where it, uh, he died, right? They buried him. No one knows where. God buried him. We don't know where. And then verse 9. Now. Now. Because of that end, now Joshua. Now Joshua. And it says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, 
was filled with the spirit of wisdom and Moses laid his hand on him. And then what? The son of Israel. And I'll put into it. And now the sons of Israel. And now, see, it was now the appointed time for Joshua. It was now the appointed time for a new stage, a new, a new life for God's people. Ends bring about beginnings. Point two. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. I thought I would, I, I said, I said, if I, if I really don't get to this point by 11.35, I'm going to be in trouble. So, 11.32. Okay. 33. Okay. Uh, let's, let's uh, apply it a little bit. Let's apply it a little bit for you and me. Because all God's word is good, but unless we apply it, it becomes objective grace, not subjective grace. In other words, it doesn't become ours. So we need to apply it. So in ways similar to Moses, God appoints and transitions for you and for me to personally and freshly experience the person and the presence of God himself in new and fresh ways. And therefore, therefore, follow the outline, therefore expect normal transitions. Expect the unexpected transitions and even expect our own physical death. And so I'm going to go through these uh, three points and, and uh, well, you just stay with me, okay? Now, youth, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, didn't seem that long ago I was a junior high. It, it's a while. <laughs> I, I was throwing newspaper. I was throwing the hair examiner. They used to have an evening new, newspaper. Uh, after school, I used to do it in junior high through the hair examiner. Um, yeah. In and, and, uh, sixth grade, my grandmother gave me a 26 inch bike. bike and, uh, I used that. I couldn't reach the pedals, but I used it. Anyway, youth, just like Hanley says, time goes by so quickly. But life is a blessing, isn't it? Life is a blessing. Uh, youth, uh, you are, you are going through physical transitions. And I'm just going to illustrate this and you read the verses, uh, very quickly. You are going through uh, transitioning physically. It's called puberty, right? Therefore, uh, uh, as you are going through puberty, uh, as you are growing emotionally, what do people tell you? Act like a lady. Be a man, right? No, do your parents tell you that? Act like a lady. Be a man. There is an expectation for you to transition from childhood to adulthood. And junior high is no no man's land. You know, you're, you're not a kid, you're not a, you're not a teenager, and definitely you're not an adult. So junior high, uh, go through it, go through it with joy. Don't, don't get into too many things. <laughs> go through it with ignorant bliss. That's what I did. I was, I was ignorant on a lot of things, and that, 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 except God. Okay, I accepted Christ when I was 12. Okay? So, what, 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 uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 is, is that, when I was a child, I, what? When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. You are transitioning physically, emotionally, mentally. Don't stay a child. This is normal. This is your normal physical maturation. Be, be a man. Look forward to be a man. Act like a lady. Don't, don't be a kid. Don't stay a kid. All right? Don't stay a kid. Made me feel like you like to be a kid. I think most middle school uh, are just big kids. Okay, uh, I think sometimes high schoolers are big kids too. I think I was sometimes. Anyway, let's go on. Uh, relational, there's relational transition that are normal relational transitions. Uh, and I, I quote uh, Genesis from the beginning, the book of beginning, where it said, For this cause a man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave or stick to his wife. There's, there are relational transitions. Uh, some of you are, are getting engaged. Don't ask me who. I'm not going to tell. Because <laughs> they told me not to tell. <laughs> okay? But you, you know, you're going to, you're, you're planning to leave your mother and father. This is, this is a transition. And we rejoice with you. We will rejoice with you. 
And young adults, which in, when I talk about young adult, I, I include all you collegiate. Collegiate, you're young adults, okay? Don't tell other people tell you are collegiate, then I adults. Yeah. You're, you're young adults and mature high schoolers. And mature high schoolers. You're, you're young adults too, okay? Uh, you're in the mutual process of relating to your parents and moving from one of child to parent to adult to adult. And you have both of, both parties have to transition. Transition. You have to mutually struggle in transitioning because if you don't, if you don't change, then there will be emotional conflict and there will be un, unfulfilled expectations on both parties. So there, there is relational transitions that come into our lives. And then there's spiritual transition. Uh, Romans 12, 2, very well-known one. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. What, what does this basically say? It says transition spiritually. Transitional spiritually. This is the spiritual application and practice of 1 Corinthians 13, 11, which we just read. Don't remain a child spiritually. In our churches, we have too many baby Christians that have been in the Lord one, two, three, four, five decades. And sometimes we bury spiritual babies at the age of 80. That's a reality. That's a reality. Don't be a spiritual baby. Be transformed. Be transformed from being a baby believer to a spiritually growing and transformed teenager, and then becoming a spiritual man. Be a man. Be a spiritual man. Guys, be a spiritual man. I told Hanley and Steve, I'm not sure I told Jonathan, when he came in at around 25, I said, hey, you know, people may think you're young, but you're a man. Act like a man. You know, preach like a man. And they have. And you have received them. And because they have, you receive them more. And will you, even though they have not as much experience as you, will you go to them with your life issues? And will you work with them and giving them some of that experience? They will go to God and they will share God's wisdom mixed in with their limited experience and they will shepherd you. Don't be reluctant to go to our young pastors. Okay? And so be a spiritual man. Act like a spiritual lady. Don't remain a baby. When I was a child, I spoke, I did as a child. When I, when time went by, I put away childish things. I no longer act, and thought like a child. So brothers and sisters, will you, will you, will you move forward in your spiritual life? Expect that. Expect that in yourself. Expect that in your fellow believer. Expect that in your children. Expect it in each other. And then encourage and help each other do it. That's why we're the church. We were not meant to do it alone. And we can't do it alone. That's why we need Emmanuel, and that's why we need the church. If we don't have God and we don't have, then we don't have the, the things that God has provided for us to be a spiritual man, a spiritual lady. Emmanuel, God with us, and the church with us. Okay? And then, expect, expect unexpected transitions which result from unexpected events, unexpected circumstances, and some of you are going through some of those unexpected circumstances right now. Nathan, or Nathaniel Wu, not Nathan. Nathaniel Wu is going through that. Jonathan and Elaine are going through that right now. They didn't expect this. They didn't expect their kid to get cancer. Alan's going through that right now. Unexpected event, unexpected expender, expected circumstances, and then unexpected leading from God, who is your shepherd, my shepherd, your master, my master. Should we not expect that our shepherd and our Lord 
which is literally master, show us and tell us and lead us at the appropriate time what he wants us to do. This was Moses' experience. This was Moses' life experience. Moses was not expected to survive the first three months. They were supposed to drown him in the river Nile. He certainly did not expect to live like a prince, nor fleet like a criminal. And after 40 years as a dull desert dweller, DDD, dull desert dweller, after 40 years as a dull desert dweller, Tell me why I'll figure that out, okay? <laughs> Make it right. Certainly he didn't expect to be a miracle worker and a Messiah-like deliverer for his enslaved countrymen. After being in the desert for 40 years, he thought, well, that's the rest of my life. That's what I'm going to do until I die. No, he didn't expect that God would come into his life, that God would move into the action through the burning bush and call him to deliver his countrymen from Egypt. Life is often, brothers and sisters, friends, life is often full of unexpected, unexpected events, circumstances, and leadings. I, I think of uh, when I was doing this, I, I thought of Chuck and, Chuck and Tui Lao. Um, I don't think they expected, certainly I know Tui did, expect to be caring for Chinese orphans and the mentally challenged in a foreign land. If you ask Tui, she'll tell you, man, that first year was, hmm, yeah. And perhaps you have your personal experience of dealing with the unexpected events, circumstances, and leading. Many of the transition of my service in vocational ministry, I, I call it vocational ministry because that's my job, okay? We are all full-time ministers. We are, we are all in ministry, okay? So I, 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 I differentiate it vocational. Many of, them, of the transition of my service in vocational ministry and transitions for our church were unexpected. I, I just share a few of you since I'm doing pretty good in time. Watch, I'm going to go over. <laughs> See, getting a little too. Uh, uh, I didn't expect to plant a church. I didn't expect to plant this church. When, when I graduated from seminary in my mid thirties, uh, and when my church, my home church, FCBCLA, called me, I said, oh boy, I get to minister at my home church, I get to learn. Uh, so I went to Dr. Lin and said, Dr. Lin, can we find a regular time where you can mentor me? Dr. Lin's old school. He said, um, you have a problem? You come to me. <laughs> that was my mentoring. <laughs> but, you know, when, when I started, Dr. Lin says, Dr. Lin was a, my pastor, Dr. Lin says, go plant a church. I, I said, what? I said, Dr. Lin, you remember, I just graduated last month, you know. Yeah, go plant a church. Uh, so, I, so me, I, I'm a fairly compliant guy. You might have <laughs> gotten to know. Uh, I said, oh, oh, oh. Okay, Dr. Lin. I said, if, if you think it's going to be okay, I guess it's going to be okay. And it was because, you know, the church was so supportive. And because God was at work. I, I didn't know God had that plan. I certainly didn't have that plan. Uh, I, I didn't expect that we would end up buying land. We were in the school for eight years. And after eight years, as a pastor, I felt that we needed to have our own place, even though not everybody at the Mother Church agreed with me. And that was hard, because these were people I grew up with. But a lot of people weren't. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a planner, I'm a thinker. I said, okay, I'm gonna find, I'm gonna find some churches that are either not growing, that's bad, or that they're growing so fast they don't need the church. 
and they 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 want to leave and give it to us or, or sell it to us. <laughs> All right. Uh, our brother found land out here, found this land. Um, and then we had to build. And when we were building, when we draw up all plans, at the uh, just before we were supposed to build, the mother church says, oh, I didn't know you guys were going to build a second floor. I said, but, but that was the plan all along. You know, otherwise when we come in, we're going to outgrow it so quick. And they said, oh, okay, if you want to. And we had pledged, the, the, the small number of us, we had pledged to our limit pretty much. And so the, the, the mother church leader says, okay, you want to build a second floor? Yeah, you just raised $600,000. Now, even then, there was a lot of money. And there was no way that I could, I figured we could raise. Then there was a lady, someone that uh, was very special in my life, uh, and her husband, and she came up and said to me, and this lady had already given five figures to that pledge. She's the same lady that gave us the uh, yellow or rainbow house. She, one day she just saw it and said, hey, you know, adjacent land is hard. I'm going to buy it and give it to you guys when you when need it. So, you know, it's not that she wasn't supportive. She, she, she came up to me and said, Jackson, yeah, if you guys want to build this, you raise one dollar, I'll match each dollar. So we raised, we, we, we tightened our belt even more. And those of you who were with us, uh, you can remember we tightened our and we raised three hundred thousand dollars, and she matched it. I didn't expect that. Unexpected circumstances. I didn't expect Rosalind Myron Jew, a family that lived in the deep San Fernando Valley. When we started the church, they said, "Jackson, we want to come and help." I said, "You moving?" I said, "No." You want to come? And they did it for ten years. And they even came to prayer meeting until at one point they said, Jackson, we're spending more time on the freeway than we are praying. I said, okay, <laughs> you guys don't have to come. Uh, uh, and, and, and when their kids grew and they needed more local church where they could take their kids and connect up with other kids, they, they're now in the San Fernando Valley. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect the growth spurts uh, and the influx and the blessing of many of you especially uh, those of Indonesian background. I didn't know there were that many Indonesians around L.A. I didn't. I, I just didn't. And now, now there's so many of you, and uh, we're, we're so glad that you're, you're here. But that was unexpected. And because of that, we grew. And, and we had the blessings and the challenges that come with growth. And through our Indonesian brothers, I never expected to go to the jungles of Borneo or Kalimantan. You know, go hopping around in a motorbike, a 120cc motorbike, on the back. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, we're, we're going in the first, my first night there. We're going because we were really late. We're on the back of a motorbike, it's dark. This guy, uh, he doesn't speak any English. I don't speak any Indonesian, and, and we're, we're, we're uh, caravanning, but it's dark. You can't see the person in front of you. And then he takes, he takes a detour. I said, oh, what's going to happen now? <laughs> so that, those are the times you say, God, <laughs> you're Emmanuel. <laughs> well, uh, I certainly didn't expect our pastoral crises especially the latest one, the last one five years ago. Didn't expect that. Wow. That threw me for a loop. Thank you for sticking with me as I was down for that. I hoped for, but I had no certainty. I had no certain expectation of God's gracious recovery, which he has granted us. And we're, we're, we're healthy again. More healthy again. What I've learned from God's word and from experiences and struggles in ministering to you, God's family, and in serving the Lord is this. You can write it down, but you don't have to. Expect the unexpected. 
expect the unexpected. You know, even as a layman, when I was a deacon, I was in the evening service in the L.A. church. Something unexpected happened. And before you knew it, I was on a plane to Northern California. Another time, I flew with a mother to Florida looking for her son. We, we, we drove up and down the beaches. We went to the police station. We opened the apartment not knowing what we would find. Story ends up okay, though. Yeah? We, we, we found him later. He's okay. But uh, those are some of the unexpected things. Expect the unexpected, not just because you're a pastor, but because you're a child of God. You're a servant of God. Don't put God in a box. God is awesome, and God is amazing, and God will surprise you. I saw Jocelyn, Jocelyn, uh, his birthday this week, and I said, may God surprise you this year. May God surprise you. God is awesome, and God is amazing, and he is going to, he is going to bring unexpected things in your life. Count on it. I expected God to be with me. I desperately counted on God to be with me. So therefore, you expect the unexpected ends and the unexpected beginnings from Him who is the Alpha and Omega beginning and end. Our worship team, I didn't expect you to sing that song. Thank you. <laughs> I said, oh, that, that fits in really nicely. <laughs> but expect that from, from Him who is the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. However, I did expect and plan my transition as your pastor. Why? Because I love you. And I saw how difficult it is to transition pastors. Uh, Dr. Murphy Lum is he was, he's, he was my teacher and counselor when I was 12 years old. And as he was retiring uh, from FCBC, he was beginning to be both physically and early Alzheimer, mentally not able to continue. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to be able to transition before I am incapacitated. And I'm not incapacitated, okay? I can still think, I can still run around a little bit, okay? Uh, but mostly because I love you. I have no errors. I have no errors. My only responsibility is to take care of Lily and her mother at this point. You are, you are my family. You are my, you are my children. And with a parent's heart, with a parent's heart, I yearn to provide someone special and someone wonderful to take care of you and to lead you, church, to your next stage of life. That's my, that's my heart's desire. My heart's desire is that God, I, this is what I ask. I pray this uh, in my uh, early 60s. In fact, starting, I think, even at 60 or a little bit before. I pray that if it is within God's grace, and, you know, Psalm tells us that we don't demand from God, but by His grace, He may give us the desire of his, our hearts. So I, I ask God that if it's within His grace and will that I may have a part in bringing about His provision, not my provision, His provision for you, my church. And he has granted me the desire of my heart. So at the end of August, I will end as your senior pastor by title, but not as your fellow member and your fellow co-worker in our church. Pastor Albert has asked me to orient him until the end of the calendar year, and that's what I'll do. And then I will worship uh, at Cross Life for about a year uh, so that you, church, well, uh, that it will be easier for you and, and uh, Pastor Albert to bond. And then, by God's grace, 
I will return. Okay? Uh, just as I expected, plan for, and execute a transition for English ministry with Pastor Hanley, God has graced our church to plan and bring about an expected transition of the pastoral leadership of Pastor Albert Ting. I think you're going to like him. He's very different from me. He's a visionary leader. He, he, he likes to go, I think he likes to, he must be tired by now, but he, he likes to go all the way around. Well, I'm a homebody. You know? We both love to eat. But you, you, you get to know him. Uh, you, and you will. And you will like him. And the end of my role as senior pastor will pave the way and give rise to new fruit in Pastor Albert and through Pastor Albert. And the end of my role vocationally with you will give rise to new fruit in you, church. And it is my prayer that it will give rise through you. And you, church, will touch. Touch our community, touch our world. So what a blessing. What a blessing. What a joy it is for me to behold this blessed transition for you, my beloved church. Finally, let me, uh, yeah, I'm going to go over it five minutes. Okay. Maybe seven. Be patient with me. Finally, let me apply Deuteronomy 34 to my and your Christian journey. Expect our physical death and a new beginning. Expect our physical death and a new beginning. Um, my grandfathers died in the 50s. Wow. But my father lived to be over 86, so I wouldn't mind somewhere in between. Well, I'm 66 this year, so I'm way beyond my grandfathers already. So I got them beat already, right? But uh, Psalm 139, 16 says, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the pa uh, passage where it says, you are awesomely and wonderfully made. It said, while you and I were in our mother's wombs, uh, God reveals, and in your book, in God's books, they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Now, I don't know what my ordains are, days are, and I'm not planning to die anytime soon, okay? <laughs> uh but this is the final earthly transition of Moses, and this will be a final earthly transition for us. And this can be an awesome or an awful transition. This can be an awesome or awful transition. And, and we all expect it. Well, not you junior hires, the high schoolers, young adults, mid adults. You guys don't believe you're going to die. You know by science you're going to die, but you don't believe it. Okay? I'm not sure I believe it yet. Okay? Uh, we all expect it, but when this actual transition comes upon you and me, often we find ourselves emotionally unprepared and oftentimes, sorry to say, spiritually unprepared for this gigantic life change. And so, were you, uh, in this brief time, will you affirm with me as I affirm with Paul in Philippians 1.23? Philippians 1.23 was uh, 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 Paul's debate with God. Is it better for me to stay or to be with you? You know, if I, and, and his conclusion was, if I stay, that means fruitful labor, but when that's done, get me out of here. What? No, that's not what it said. What did he say? What did he say? To be with Christ is very much better. It's not only better, it's not only much better, it's very much better. So let's affirm that. Will you affirm that in your life? Don't put all your hopes and your eggs in this life. Some of you are doing that. Don't do that. Not if you are a child of God. Don't put all your eggs in in this life's basket because there's so much more life because through the doorway of physical death is a new beginning and it is so awesome that we can't understand it that's why I think that God doesn't reveal it much in his word but will you understand that it is very much better that's, that's God's word 
God is a person of his word. He doesn't lie. All right? And then there's also a new stage, a deeper experience of eternal life. And I refer you again, as I often have, to John 17, 3. What is eternal life? We are living eternal life now. What is eternal life? Eternal life is to know God and to know Christ and to live with Him. And when we go out of our physical body, we go into a new realm of a new experience of living life with the presence and the person of Emmanuel. So will you affirm that? Then, therefore, if we do that, I look forward and yearn for my end. I, I tell the people in the office, half jokingly, see, see that, see that uh, lime green box over there? That's a defibrillator. I said, if I have a heart attack, don't use that thing on me. Let me go, <laughs> okay? And when I have a heart attack, I, I ask God to give me a good one. Not one of these little ones, you know? <laughs> that, that sort of just gets your arm or your mouth, you know? I said, give me a good one. And don't let any of these guys use that defibrillator on me. Because there's a song that I learned. I'm taking too much time. Well, I don't, I don't do this very often, so I, I, uh, there's a song that I learned when I was a kid, and uh, it, 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 I think it speaks uh, uh, my perspective. It says, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I can't feel at home in this world. I, I do feel at home with you. Uh, Lily and I have a a tremendous life together. What a blessing. What a blessing. Yeah. Those of you engaged, better yet to come. Yeah. There's even better to come. All right? You think engagement's good. Life is even better. As pet married couples. Anyway, so, but yet, part of me says, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. That's part. We, we should. Not that this world is bad, and that this church, Emmanuel, God with us, is, but even, there's even more. There is new beginning, there's fresh experience of eternal life. So, conclusion, central truth. I see, I learned from Hanley. The central truth is. <laughs> <laughs> Endings and transitions open up the way for new beginning for God's servant, for God's people. I want to be faithful, and yet I want to still yet grow in Jesus as I end the stage of my vocational servanthood. And I look forward to fresh and new beginnings of serving the Lord with you, my church. My vocation as your pastor will end, but my advocation, my passion as your fellow servant of our Lord Jesus Christ endures. May this transition pave the way for new and fruitful beginnings with Pastor Albert and with our continuing pastoral staff and especially may it Open the way for fresh and new fruitful beginning for you, my church. Ecclesiastes 3.1 There is a point of time for every event on the earth in heaven. Let you and me finish well in our endings. And then let's look forward to starting well in our appointed beginnings with the person and the presence of our Lord God, our immutable constants, with Jesus as our Alpha and our Omega, our beginning and our end. Shall we pray? Awesome and holy God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, your people. Thank you for the appointments that you have made that we know of. Thank you for the appointments that you will bring into our life yet. 
Thank you for the transitions and the unexpected events and callings and leadings. And with all these, Lord, we will entrust them to you. We will, as last week's sermon, we will be spiritually alert. We will stand firm and resist the devil. And we will entrust ourselves to you, trusting that you will do the right thing in our lives and in our church. And God's people said, Amen.